So this is me as a five or six year old and I had blocks and Legos and I would make buildings and cities and, and I, I learned a couple things. First of all, it's, um, I, have, I learned that I had neither the talent nor temperament to be an architect. Um, but I learned about this guy. Um, this is Jim Rouse. Rouse was uh, actually the, the first guy to commercialize the mall. This is Santa Monica Place 1.0. It doesn't look like that anymore. Um, actually, Frank Gehry was his longtime architect. They worked together for about 15 years. He designed Santa Monica Place. Um, Rouse also was the first guy to develop the whole concept of the festival marketplace. That's, Bo that's Faneuil Hall in Boston. He did South Street Seaport in New York and Harbor Place in Baltimore. He created the first planned city, and really the only planned city in the U.S., that's Columbia, Maryland. And for you new urbanism fans, he was doing things like walkable neighborhoods and neighborhoods organized around retail and hospitals about 10 years before Seaside. In the 80s, he started what is still today the enterprise, which is still today the largest supporter of affordable housing. They do about a billion dollars a year in tax credits and grants for affordable housing. Um, so Rouse was very successful doing these things. Um, what with us being in LA, we of course have to have a little Hollywood moment. That's right, that's um, uh, Ed Norton Jr. That's actually his grandson who was born in uh, Columbia, Maryland, and who's on the board of Enterprise. So studying Rouse, I got a few things. Um, first of all, he turned me on to this concept of companies that wed profit and purpose. So it turns out that Rouse was a deeply religious guy who felt that it was his God-given responsibility to try to do good work with the, with the work he was doing. He never talked about that to investors. To investors, it was all about return on investment. And for the most part, he did very well for investors. Rouse's company was public in the 70s. But to his employees, he talked very much about how the work they, was do, they were doing were, were really helping to, was really helping to improve communities. It was actually good for, for, for communities. Now you might say, um, cool, but what does that have to do with malls? Well, actually when he started developing malls in the 50s, um, uh, suburbs were where many GIs were moving with their families because that's where there was affordable housing. And Rouse felt that the suburbs needed some town square. He felt that that was critical for the health and vibrancy of that community. So he saw malls. He didn't do the first one. That was in uh, 1952 outside of Minneapolis. He did the second one. He felt that malls were sort of the new paradigm of the town square because they were covered. They're like an all-weather town square. He then got into uh, the uh, idea of the festival marketplace first in Boston because in the 70s you had middle class moving from cities and he wanted a way to bring them back. So he saw uh, festival marketplaces as a way to preserve great architecture, provide low income jobs, bring people back in to the uh, 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 blighted city centers, help to redevelop the areas. So like Rouse, I, have, I felt, this was in college when I was studying him, an onus to try to add value to my work. Mine isn't based on any kind of religious foundation, although I, I guess there is a spiritual component, but it's more just golden rule. I just felt like everybody should add a little value in their work. The world would be better if everybody did that. And I recognize that people who are teachers and healthcare workers did it very directly every day through the work they did, people who worked for nonprofits. But I was drawn to commerce, and Rouse was the first guy to turn me on to this concept. And this is in the 80s, by the way, long before social entrepreneurism was popular. He took me on this concept of businesses where integral in that which you, makes your product or service successful are things that also make it purposeful. And when you create a successful business, let's define that as one that's profitable, because if you're not profitable, it's, it's hard to make payroll for any extended period. Um, when you do that, and it's never easy, that business can grow, and whatever beneficence is integral in that product or service then gets to spread. So you get to co-opt capitalism which is a very, very effective distribution mechanism, but which has no ethic to help spread some good stuff. So I kind of like that concept. They said, someday I'd like to do that. Two, he helped me to realize that developers are more important than architects. Any architects here? You, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Because developers hire you or they don't, and they let you do responsible, cool, interesting things or not, right? So he said, I should become a developer. A. <laughs> 
I have no talent to be an architect, B, developers are more important, and C, the world I concluded could use more responsible developers like Wells. So that was the plan. I spent a couple decades in technology, and when I, when I finally decided the time was right to focus on real estate, this is like 2005, I felt it was this rocket ship that would just never come back to Earth. I was wrong on that part. But um, <laughs> I think we got some other things right. And one is, is our customer. We sort of observed the following, that there are more and more people who really appreciate great design. So, you know, Michael Graves are the best-selling products at Target, actually. Um, obviously, Apple products. Um, uh, uh, for, uh, design within reach and Ikea. Um, Wired magazine. Uh, so I just kind of illustrated some products that, that, that have become really popular based on their form and functionality. There are also increasingly people who care about the health and sustainability of the products they buy, right? So we're driving Priuses and buying organic cotton in Patagonia and shopping Whole Foods. The problem is the production home builders, the KB Homes, the Mars Pulte, Centexes of the world, they don't build for these variously called cultural creatives. So he said, I'm going to start a company to do that. And our formula is pretty simple. We just get great world-class architects. We don't screw up their design work, I hope. We integrate an extremely comprehensive environmental program, and we use factory production to do what we do better, quicker, cheaper, and with smaller ecological footprint. So Ray Cappy, our first architect, he started SciArc. He's a modernist, but he really integrates a craftsman-like attention to detail and warmth in his work. And I think most people don't want a modern home, by the way. Most people want the stuff that the KB Homes and Lenaris Pultis do, God bless them. But there are a big chunk of us who want a modern home in form and functionality. And I think those of us who do want a modern home want a warm space. Um, we're also working with Kieran Timberlake. They were the firm of the AIA firm of the year a couple years ago. Um, just a really fantastic firm. They do great work. Quick primer on prefab. So I'm going to talk about different systems and I'm going to move from things that happen mostly in the factory to things that happen mostly on site. So manufactured is the biggest category. That's, those have to confirm to HUD, Housing and Urban Development, basically mobile homes. Modular is what we mostly do. Think of them as big Lego pieces and you have to conform to local building code. Then there's panelized where you're doing walls or roofs, more work on site, and the last category is kit homes. Um, that's where pieces come in, um, uh, are pre-cut, and they're assembled on site. By the way, I'm doing a 45-minute presentation in 18 minutes. That's why I'm moving quickly. So <laughs> when you do this right, when you do prefab right, you get better quality. It's less expensive. It definitely saves a lot of time. And it saves a lot of time because when you do things traditionally on site, you have to first do the site work. And only when you're done can you frame it and start doing the plumbing, electrical, and all that fun stuff. With prefab, as you are doing the site work, you're working on the building off-site, so you can do things much faster. We're doing things, we're building homes in LA in six months or so, that's about a third of the time, half if you pay contractors a lot of money that it normally takes. So that's how we're able to cheat gravity. You can also save money too. Um, so we mostly use modules, but we, um, we also use panels for certain spaces that don't require a lot of complexity. And by the way, I'm, I'm trying to speed through this stuff because I want to show you pretty pictures and talk about our environmental program. That's what I'm most proud of. So this is um, a number of our homes in various stages of undress. And now I'm going to show you um, one being assembled. And we actually did this for the TED conference in 2009, um, where I actually gave a, a short talk, um, which um, I was quite nervous for. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, first thing we did, had to do is create the foundation. It's a Long Beach Performing Arts Center, so it was a temporary foundation. This home is comprised of four modules. Um, it's 2,000 square feet, so that's the first one coming in. And um, the, the, the homes are shipped like 90% complete from the factory, 93% complete. That's the kitchen module with, with, and living room with the appliances, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> The bathrooms have all the tiles, all the rough and finished plumbing and electrical all done in the factory. <laughs> so this opened to the TED conference four days later. Um, uh, all the stuff we had to do, any place there's a seam, which is a place between the modules, well then we have to put on the cladding and the 
floor material that spans between the seams the seams, but that's why we're able to do things very quickly, very efficiently, and with much less construction waste, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is our first home. Um, this is in Santa Monica. Um, this is actually my home. And I think, and, and this, is, this is like signature Ray Cappy. If you've ever seen Ray Cappy's work, he's, he's just, he's a serious master. And, and, and I think, as I said, I think one of the most successful things we've done is, as I said, not screw up the great design work of our architects. I think another great thing we've done is um, uh, the environmental program here is extraordinarily comprehensive. In fact, this is the first home ever certified LEED Platinum ever. Um, and I'll talk about what that means and why that's significant. But hopefully when you're looking at this, you're not going, that's cool, but it's a green home. Like that's, I, could, I couldn't live there. Um, because one of the biggest insights we had when we were starting the company was like, this isn't the first time we've had an energy crisis, right? Energy crisis 1.0 happened in the 70s, and there were a lot of green homes done as a result. But the problem was straw bale, they were underground. They just weren't homes that, most, that many people wanted to live in. So we said, first and foremost, we have to create homes. This is a home we did in Brentwood that solve what we call the lifestyle living needs. Like people need to really love these homes. Oh, by the way, we need to build them in an extraordinarily responsible way, but that can't be the first goal. The first goal can't be how it's built. The first goal has got to be how it functions. Then we got to build it responsibly. This is the same home we built at TED. It's now um, uh, in Newport Beach. Um, first uh, lead platinum uh, building in Newport Beach. Uh, this is the first we did with Kieran Timberlake. Oh, by the way, we're doing one right by my house. My house is in the Ocean Park District. We're doing one of these um, right next to the dog park off Beverly. Uh, that'll get installed early next month. This is our first multifamily. This is the first um, uh, uh, lead platinum multifamily in San Francisco. This is in the Presidio and uh, also Kieran Timberlake. And it's the first um, building ever designed in a modern vernacular in the Presidio, which was a pain in the butt, to be honest. <laughs> this, is a, um, this is the first uh, uh, multifamily Ray Cappy we've done. Um, this is the last building we did. This is in Los Altos. And if you have any friends in Northern California, I'm actually speaking in Los Altos December 8th. And that's not necessarily that big a deal. But what's cool is I'm speaking at the Neutra House. So for you fans of Richard Neutra, um, see? Um, he's like one of my favorite architects. You'll be able to actually go in, his, in, in this house he built there. So that's a reason to go. I love that they put this, statue, that this thing there. This sort of like the thinker, but it's not. Um, <laughs> so this is, um, this is our first uh, community. There's four living homes that we're doing in Toronto. So that's, that's what it's going to look like. Um, and then this, this is also in production. This is another... Um, home in Santa Monica that we're building on Adelaide just off 7th. That's a Ray Cappy design. Um, super cool, totally psyched. So take a step back, you know, why should you care about this stuff? For those of us concerned about climate change, um, uh, turns out buildings are the biggest problem. It's not industry, it's not cars. Um, the energy required to heat, cool, and light buildings is 39% of U.S. energy consumption. If we look at electricity, it's even more dramatic. And if we look at some of these other outputs, carbon emissions, water use, waste, it's huge. Um, so the bad news is the biggest problem that needs to be addressed are buildings that we live in, that we play in, that we learn in. Um, the good news is, unlike some of the other technologies and, and areas that, that, that tend to get a lot of press, for example, truly cost-effective long-range electric cars or cellulosic ethanol process that doesn't complete with food stock. I mean, many of those areas, they're like still working on basic science. The technology, if you will, to dramatically reduce the energy and carbon use in water for buildings exists. You can go to Home Depot, get this stuff increasingly for no more money than it costs to do non-sustainable stuff. So that's the good news. Um, so we use the LEED program um, as an external measure of what we're doing. Um, LEED stands for Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. Uh, it's a point-based program and you get different points for things you do that make your homes more energy or water waste efficient. Um, the bigger point though is not 
the lead point, but rather, you know, what are the implications for resource use? But consumers like third-party verification, so it's important for us. But what lead doesn't do is directly address how do you create a zero energy home, water, emissions, carbon, waste. So we, we developed this program we call Z6 that set the goals to which we, we aspire to achieve for every home. We don't hit all of them for every home, though some of, uh, though we, we generally hit zero energy with our homes, um, and we have a new home coming out that'll hit zero on almost everything. So I'm gonna very quickly, I'm running out of time, talk about the things that we do to do this. Energy is the most important category. And by the way, everything I tell you, I'm, I talk about that we do in our homes, you can do in your own buildings. Energy is the most important category to get right. Your buildings will use more energy over their useful life than is embodied in the materials used to create those homes. So get this one right. First, insulate it as much as possible, then reduce the energy use. So we use LED lights that use a tenth of the power of incandescent, and they're dimmable, and no mercury. We like radiant heating because we can preheat with the sun. It's a more efficient way to heat. It's also healthier, forced air. Energy Star appliances. We use photovoltaics to create the power we need. For water, all of our fixtures are low flow, dual flush toilets. All of our homes come gray water ready. Um, so gray water is using sink, shower, bath water for irrigation. Um, we uh, encourage our clients to put in cisterns. So that's a 3,500 gallon cistern that collects stormwater runoff and we use that for irrigation. Emissions, this is an indoor air quality issue. There are things like volatile organic compounds, urea, for, uh, formaldehyde. Uh, these are compounds you find in the adhesives and millwork and, and, and carpets. They're bad stuff. More and more research finding um, linkages to skin and eye irritation, head irritation, even some cancers. So our millwork is formaldehyde free. Our fireplaces burn denatured alcohol, no smoke, almost no carbon. Um, we have got fans that take out carbon monoxide before it seeps up into your house. Automatic fans in the bathroom that take out moisture before it, that they might cause mold. Uh, we integrate as much as possible indoor gardens. We found some really cool research NASA did on space stations. So we have plants that filter formaldehyde and that produce a lot of oxygen. So that's part of the indoor air quality system. For carbon and waste, almost all of our materials are recycled and reused. Um, our wood is Forest Stewardship Council certified wood, so it's a nonprofit that certifies that wood is grown and harvested in a sustainable way. Our tile is from recycled glass. We've got countertops from cellulose, which is uh, newsprint, or recycled glass or mirrors. We don't demolish homes, we deconstruct them and we donate the, where we have existing properties, and that we donate the materials to Habitat for Humanity. We use a lot of steel, which is the most recycled building materials, basically old cars, almost done. One cool thing we also do in our homes, homes generally aren't designed to adapt to people's changing lifestyle needs. You're single, you get married, you have a kid, you have more kids, in-laws moving. Renovation is incredibly wasteful, expensive, stressful. So we bake in features like, these are options, but movable walls so you can open and close and change rooms, modular millwork uh, storage units that you can move around, and indoor and external uh, space that you can expand. So if I, for example, ever want a fourth bedroom, I can put a floor plate and two wall plates, and I can expand that to a fourth bedroom. Some of our models, you can add rooms. So um, the last thing, I've, I've described five of the six Zs. The last one is ignorance. You can do lots of things to reduce your home's energy or water use or resource use, but frankly, if the people who live don't make responsible choices, you can have a big ecological footprint. So I, of course, have a Prius, and it's green if you don't get the point. And there's an ingenious uh, screen that tells you in real time what your mileage is, and also over time, it becomes a video game. You want to get that score. It's, you want to get the mileage as much as possible. So we developed one, a system like that with a company for our home. So it tells you in real time what your energy use and water use. And it, research has shown when you do that with people, like they'll reduce their energy use 20% just by being conscious of that. And for those of you with kids, a cool thing is you can tell when your kids are partying because the energy <laughs> use and goes up. So um, that, that's it. The last thing I'll show you is uh, you can go to our site and you can configure our homes like cars. You can pick different features and find out your budget and your lead points. And uh, we do scheduled tours on Fridays. So I'm Steve at livinghomes.net, happy to show you what we're doing. And the tie into hope is, I hope stuff like this 
Um, and we're, we're rounding air in the building industry, although we, we, we're, we're doing okay. We actually had our best year last year, which is hard in this market. I, and there are many more people doing this stuff. I hope more and more responsible design will be done that will reduce ecological footprints of buildings, and that's the biggest problem. I also hope for those of you who also wanted to be architects, you can see there are alternatives. So thank you very much. <laughs>